Chairman, welcome and thank you for joining us in this morning discussion on new models for online content governance. My name is Marjorie Buxo. I'm heading the Digital Society Initiative at Chatham House, which is also strategic partners of the Doha Forum 2019. Um, so you may have been in a few technology governance sessions already, and I think we could all agree that this is a really um, rapidly evolving and vast topic of areas for international affairs. And this morning, we thought it'd be very important to zoom in in a specific um, area of this technology governance and its online content, um, online information, and to some extent, uh, human interactions online. And so just to give you a little bit of insight on the why we thought uh, this topic was really important to address um, immediately and sort of deserve the attention of the DOA delegate here um, in this forum. I think there are two, two main reasons. The, the first one, um, I think we agree that we're facing an information crisis. Digital platforms have been utilized to um, spread hate speech, to spread abusive, harmful content, extreme messages. They've also been linked to the extremization of political discourse, of disinformation campaign, and had important consequences for the democratic processes and elections. Um, but also at the same time and in parallel, we also seen the mushrooming and sort of proliferation of new ideas, new regulations, new initiative in, in the space, both from the public sector and, and the private sector. And so this morning, we, we really fortunate to have a excellent panel, I must say of expert, practitioner, that are pioneering this, this field of online um, content governance. And, and I'm going to turn to them um, in a minute, and they're going to have the opportunity to review the different efforts and the progress that have been made in the space. Um, but I also want to keep a significant portion of time uh, for you to be able to ask your question, because ultimately we are all, or almost all, digital users. We're definitely information um, consumers and potentially even information creators. So I think it's important, and also for a panel, that um, they hear your thoughts and, and your and you concern. Um, so on that note, I'm going to start with Peggy. Peggy, um, your director was the Office of um, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. You've been in that space for, for a long time. You've also been with Human Rights Watch. Um, and it's really interesting because the other day, one of your colleagues, Fabrizio Horace Drummond, that works with the Secretary General on, on digital issues, um, he, for him, he expressed the fact that he thought that human rights is the area where we've made the most progress, where um, it has been applied relatively successfully to the digital space. Um, would you agree with this assessment? Do you think that human rights have been adopted um, successfully by the digital platforms and online communities? Thanks, Marjorie. Really glad to be here. Um, I think that's a good starting point because I, I would agree with Fabrizio that uh, there has been a profound uh, commitment on the part of many actors in this space, both governments and tech companies, to do that work. There's still a very long way to go. Um, if you look at the number of sets of AI ethical principles that have been developed uh, by companies, by governments, by academics, um, they overlap a lot. Uh, but the one thing they have in common is that they haven't changed practice very much so far. So we still have a long way to go. Um, and I guess my underlying message is about how important it is to, to make that bridge happen. Human rights law isn't just something that might be helpful to our discussion of these issues. It's an absolutely essential foundation for our discussion of new technologies, of online content, and of artificial intelligence. Let me explain why I think so. It's, the, the key here is that we have, when we look at these issues, we have fundamentally difficult questions that need to be resolved. And right now there is a, a tension developed uh, globally over different models of how to resolve those issues. The one thing that uh, all those who are competing in this space actually agree on is the international human rights law framework, which has been adopted globally by consensus and provides fundamental guidance for how these questions can be addressed. So it's, you know, it may not be the ending point, but it's certainly a really important starting point. It is universal. It can bring together all countries and all actors around things that they've already agreed to. And there's a lot of work that's been done 
to develop that framework legally and to give some of those answers. Um, it's also really important that it, it addresses um, all rights, not just the, the privacy rights uh, or non-discrimination rights, but it's also relevant to rights of employment um, or health rights. Uh, are all implicated uh, through the international legal framework. Um, if I could just then flag three tensions, though, that we're really grappling with. The first is around the tension between free expression and uh, misinformation, online content, hate speech that you flagged. Um, there is, as you said, an information crisis, but I think one of the things that we see in a crisis is that everybody wants to jump to a solution and to find the, the easy answer. Well, the problem here is that there aren't easy answers and that whatever answer we come up with has to be legally sound. It has to be transparent. It has to have a basis that is understandable and can be replicated across that framework. And that's what we're really striving for and I hope we'll hear a lot about today. The second tension relates to the role of governments and of the private sector in this space. Um, we're really in uncharted territory here in terms of the role that private companies are playing. We've all heard that. Well, the good news is that this is another area where the human rights framework can help. The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which we heard talked about in the earlier plan panel today in the plenary, really talks about what role does government need to play in terms of regulating this space and what do we expect from companies in terms of their obligations to respect human rights. And the final tension is really about who are the people behind this. We talk about the need for what we do to be human-centered, but in this instance, you know, just as one example, we have a stark issue relating to do we use machines to regulate this content, which gives rise to all sorts of questions about free expression and whether the machines are capable, the algorithms really work, or do we use people to do it while, where we've seen the, the impact of doing this on people can be incredibly damaging to their health and their rights. So there are these tensions that we're going to have to resolve and I think in each area, human rights law is really gonna help us. Great, thank, thank you, thank you, Peggy. So, so it, I think it's a, it's a great segue in terms of tension and this question of freedom of expression. Um, so, Jacob, you're executive uh, director of Justitia, which is a Copenhagen-based think tank, which promotes uh, fundamental rights and freedom of, of uh, freedom rights. Um, so I think through your analysis, you also sort of demonstrate that actually the development of regulation in this space may have had a chilling effect on freedom of expression, maybe leading to its erosion. So could you tell us more about where does new regulation are, are going? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's interesting to, to go back to 2010 uh, when Mark Zuckerberg was named uh, Time Person of the Year. And then fast forward to 2018 when New York Times labeled him an enlightened despot. I think that shows a, uh, a, a seismic shift in the perception of, of social media from sort of the harbingers of, of global freedom of democracy and to being seen as constituting a threat to those very values by weaponizing propaganda, disinformation, hate speech, extremism. Uh, and so on. And that backlash has, has resulted in a raft of laws globally. So if you go to Freedom House's last report on freedom on the net, we see that global online freedom is in retreat for the ninth uh, consecutive uh, year. And what is striking is that European democracies now are <laughs> sort of, uh, at least some of them, in the vanguard of this development of regulating online uh, content. Uh, the most prominent example is Germany's uh, Network Enforcement Act of 2018, which uh, basically is a model of inter, uh, intermediary liability, which means that uh, social media companies have to remove illegal content within 24 hours or, 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 or seven days, depending uh, on, on, on the content, or, fist, or, ra or risk uh, huge uh, fines. Um, the danger of this is, of course, that this provides an incentive to, uh, to social media companies to over-implement, to remove uh, content that would that, that does not violate uh, uh, standards uh, and also to uh, employ machine learning uh, even upload filters that would remove uh, content uh, even before it's e visible so that would basically be a return to preventive censorship of the kind that was abolished in, in, in most of Europe in the 19th century, but only on a vastly larger scale and without any of the transparency uh, 
uh, or, or checks and balances normally involved in these cases. Uh, Zoe can then tell us about Facebook's initiative to counter this, uh, but, but that's one of the dangers. Uh, now, France, the UK, and certainly the European Commission are, are, are moving in the same direction, but in, in our recent report, my organization has shown that a number of authoritarian states have more or less copy-pasted the German law. So this in, in includes Venezuela, Russia, Belarus, who's, who, who, who mentions explicitly the German law and then uh, uh, employ their own draconian laws that, that are used to stifle, uh, that are used to stri stifle uh, free speech. Um, um, so uh, th these, these measures are obviously problematic, in my view, at least from a, from a human rights uh, point of view, basic point uh, being Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, and contrary to the approach of European democracies, the UN, and not least the Special Rapporteur on, on Freedom of Expression, David Kay, has actually developed a number of quite thoughtful and detailed standards uh, that are much more speech protective, both in terms of where you draw the red line, but also when it comes to the, to, to the system of, of content moderation that, will, that, that, that complies with, with, uh, with international human rights standards. So, so just to, to, to sum it up, I would say that the spread of illiberal ideas is uh, increasingly being countered with illiberal laws, and I think that we are at the point where the cure is, is, is worse than the disease. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to go to Zoe in a minute, but I, I want to be for a second a devil's advocate. And I, I, I understand that, um, you know, Germany and, and other um, European states have created this new regulation and they've been applied and copied in other jurisdictions. But um, they may have other application. In, in, in Europe, we have check and balances, uh, these due diligence processes that prevent those legislation to be um, applied maybe too harshly. And so are we comparing apples to apples here, or could we really say that it's the same type of legislation? That's, that's definitely, you know, the, the German law is well-intentioned, uh, and it certainly has more safeguards than, say, in Russia or, or, or Belarus. But uh, some of the transparency you'll not see, because if Twitter removes 40,000 pieces of content, uh, you will not know you'll not know on what basis did they apply this, did, did, did they apply the Nets GG law as it was, uh, only if, if someone then brings a complaint. And, and also, now we're talking at the global level, and then I think, Democracies have, you know, an obligation to err on the side uh, of freedom. You can't, as, as uh, uh, you, you, know, you know, that there needs to be certain bright lines between Germany and Russia when it comes to to, to online freedom. Uh, so, so, so I think it's a difficult position for democracies to say we want these kind of draconian uh, things, but you can't have them in, in Russia because you'll use them in, in a different way. That does not mean that democracies can't. Uh, have limits on free speech, but those limits, uh, I think, are, are, are much better balanced and c more carefully thought out uh, under, the, uh, under the standards developed under the UN, which are more speech protective than those uh, applied uh, in Germany uh, and, and even the European Court of Human Rights um, in, in the European system. Thank you, Jacob. So, Zoe, we heard that Facebook is actually quite active in, in, in the space. Uh, you're general manager for the uh, global affairs and governance. But it's really interesting that you used to be a civil servant with the US Department of Justice, then you went to the UN, and then you did the me big move to the tech sector, and not any technology company, but, but Facebook. And you now uh, managing sort of the developing the Facebook oversight board. And in the earlier conversation, um, you expressed the fact that initially the international community was somewhat sceptical about um, the development of this board, but with the evolution of, of it and more efforts and resources that your company have put in, there's, there's more and more interest. So um, I'm sure we all, all our delegates are also interested to hear about what exactly is this board and where are you in this process? Are we ready to see some of the decision um, from the board members? Great, thank you so much, Marjorie. So I'll actually start by referencing um, what my co-panelists have already mentioned. You know, Peggy really focused on uh, the core international human rights instruments that can be used um, to, to help guide some of our tough decisions on, 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 on content that, that may be harmful but not necessarily um, illegal, I would say. 
And then um, Jacob really mentioned how national laws are being put in place to address the same issue. But parallel to what's been established through the international community and what's been established by national governments, tech companies are also trying to sort out exactly what they can do to put in place um, proper guidance to help, uh, to help um, provide a framework for decision making around difficult content. And so the oversight board really sits within um, that conversation. And so the oversight board, which you may have heard um, colloquially referred to as the Facebook Supreme Court, will be a body of approximately 40 independent experts who will hear cases, hard cases, in panels of uh, five members each. These cases will um, exactly illuminate the trade-offs between the different human rights that might be implicated, especially around, for example, uh, where freedom of expression might butt up against freedom of privacy or freedom uh, or, or the right to privacy or the right to safety, for example. Um, and so the advantage of the oversight board is that these conversations will be had out in the public. Um, so the board will deliberate on cases and determine if expression um, really should be upheld, uh, even though there may be some safety implications or there may be privacy implications, but really we should err on the side of free expression. Um, if they do that on individual content decisions, those will all be made public and those will be binding. So if there is a, a piece of content that we took down under our hate speech policy, but the board decides that it's important political speech and it needs to be um, part of civil discourse, then we are obligated to um, return that to the platform. The second function that the board will have is to give policy recommendations to us. So one criticism of the board is that it will hear very few cases, and, um, and that's correct. We receive millions of, uh, of, of reports each week, and the board will only be able to hear cases on the order of dozens, not thousands, not tens of thousands. Um, but the cases that they will choose will be highly emblematic, and they'll demonstrate where our policies may need adjustments, where they may need wholesale changing. Um, and they'll make those recommendations back to us based on their review of cases, and then we'll route that through our, um, our policy development process. And that's how we see the board having some level of precedent setting for the future. Um, so that's essentially how it will run. This is a bit of a grand experiment, I will admit. Uh, and so we do hope that people will, um, will go with us on this journey and have some patience with us as we try to set up something that's, um, that is completely new. Uh, and, so, um, and so I look forward to what is in store for Facebook and for the Oversight Board in 2020. Thanks, Zoe. And, and just, it's quite interesting that, so you have 40 board members which will represent 3 million users. How do you, how do you manage that diversity? Will they represent your user? What, sure. What's your, could you talk a bit about your selection? Sure. So um, we know that the board will not be perfectly representative of uh, 2.7 billion users, not at 40 members and not at 400 members. Um, nevertheless, we are aiming for a globally diverse board, um, and by diverse I mean geographically balanced, gender balanced, um, and, and diverse in terms of expertise. So the types of profiles we're looking at range from constitutional law professors to journalists, former journalists, to uh, human rights advocates. Um, like Peggy, I would say, um, but uh, Peggy is currently serving at the UN, so she's disqualified as an official. Uh, and so we are, uh, we are, we are looking to announce the first group of twenty names in February. One thing that we did hear is that uh, the board wouldn't be legitimate if we just chose alone. So we're picking three co-chairs, and those co-chairs will um, will choose with us for the first cohort of members. Thanks, Barry. Um, so we, we heard just right now about a few ideas and initiative from the UN, national regulation, and, and private sector. Um, so I, I want to turn to you, Peter. So you general counsel was with Access Now. Um, you're, you're with the policy team, was was the NGO, and so you're advocating for 
a more accountable and responsible tech sector. What is also really interesting with Access Now is that you have all these uh, regional helplines, mm -hmm. and so to say you have your ears to the ground and sort of where the activist and online community can report abuse but also uh, pressure on on freedom of, of expression. So what do you hear from the community? Do you see improvement thanks to this um, effort? So yeah. actually do you think that the situation hasn't changed? Thank you. I do want to get to the, to the headline of the panel, which is new models. And uh, I think this Facebook uh, board is an interesting one. Uh, but unfortunately though, I think we're, we're still quite uh, entrenched with, with many old models for, for dealing with uh, content that the users and, and individuals and journalists and human rights defenders and citizens are putting online. And those old models uh, use old tools, including you know, arrests. There's new cybercrime laws that are being passed all over the world uh, that governments are eagerly using to arrest journalists uh, and imprison and silence people for what they've said and done online. Uh, at the same time, internet shutdowns are on the rise. Internet shutdowns are a form of online content governance. Uh, they're an extreme form, but unfortunately, uh, we counted in the hashtag keep it on coalition at least 128 shutdowns in the first six months of 2019. Um, that's a record uh, growing even on uh, 2018's stark numbers. Uh, this, is, this is a blunt and incredibly destructive tool that governments are wielding to govern content online to silence voices and communities. We get these cases through our digital security helpline. That's a 24 hour a day service that's run uh, in nine languages globally. It's a civil society run led um, and a civil society serving digital help desk. We provide direct technical support uh, to people. And the majority of the, the requests we get are for support after something's gone wrong. People are being attacked for who they are, for who their community is, and for what they stand for. These attacks take the form of <coughs> blunt shutdowns of, of entire communities, but they're also much more targeted. It's invasive spyware that's getting into people's phones and uh, discovering everything about their lives, their contacts, their loved ones. It's taking the form also of uh, censorship and harassment. So the, of the 5,000 or so cases that we've handled in the last six years on our helpline, um, up to 20% and increasing involve uh, what we term content governance. Uh, they take two forms. First is harassment. Uh, people come to us requesting support uh, to deal with uh, abusive behaviors and abusive accounts online. Um, and second, censorship. People are trying to restore the data, the information, the content, the stories, the narratives, the pictures, the videos that they've put their time and their lives into collecting and, and posting to share with their communities. And some of this data is, is irretrievable once it's taken down by the platforms. Um, and it's also incredibly essential to finding accountability uh, for human rights in the digital age, and beyond that, accountability for all sorts of uh, human rights violations, even atrocities. The majority of the uh, cases that we've received, the requests for support on content governance issues, have come from Syria. Um, second is Vietnam, third is Nicaragua. So the type of content that people are posting from these places is irreplaceable. It's essential documentation of human rights violations. And frankly, to date, the platforms have not provided the transparency, have not done the due diligence on how to develop policies and programs that respect human rights, and have not provided accountability uh, for their impacts, uh, their decision, the impacts of their decisions uh, governing our content. Thank you, Peter. So we may be at some point you'll insert to that. But first, um, I, I want to turn now to Ben. Um, ben, you're executive, no, you're not executive, you're editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed, and you work obviously with a lot of reporters, editors. You are a journalist. You've, you've done investigative journalists. You've done long piece. Um, and so what we hear a lot in this space, in this new spaces of governance, is that one doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are norms, there are codes of conduct, especially from the journalist, com journalist community, that could or should be reapplied to, to online content. 
Um, so would you agree with sort of what, are, what, what type of norms do you think that should be used from journalism and or do you think that these are two completely different beasts and they should be treated as such? Huh, I think that's a really good question. I mean, I, yeah, when you say I'm a journalist, you, what you really mean is that like 50% of this has gone over my head. Um, and, and I think, you know, there, there are, you know, journalism has some fairly basic rules which are mostly captured by like the Ten Commandments, you know, you don't, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Um, but I do think that one of the key features of the last five years that hasn't totally been captured here is that all of these kind of frameworks and attempts to sort of build out an ideology around the platforms has really developed in response to a series of rolling PR and political crises. Most of the platform's decisions haven't come out of meetings like this and policy frameworks. They've come out of public relations crises, rapid response, figure out the ideology and apply it later. Um, you know, so there was the Alex Jones stuff, there was Sandy Hook, there was Christchurch, there was, um, I can't read my handwriting, but there's a, you know, there's, there, there's an, you, you know all the, the sort of points. And, um, and often you would talk to somebody at YouTube and say, well look, like we know Alex Jones is loathsome, but it's a very important principle that we would never take anybody down just because they're loathsome. But of course six months later they take them down because they're not um, you know, philosophers, they're running private companies. And I think in the United States in particular, they're facing this really deep political crisis because the Republicans hate them because they're Silicon Valley liberals and the Democrats hate them because they elected Trump. And they have no, so they have no natural allies and they're totally on defense and reactive. Um, you know, and I think, I do think that this sort of effort to provide transparency around decisions is a really interesting step. But I think it's going to happen again in the context of politics, of public relations, of operating a private business. And for instance, this, cri this sort of crisis that we were, the reactive PR crisis we were writing about yesterday was that the US Senate um, named Russia Today, the Russian sort of news propaganda outlet as, as part of the disinform Russian disinformation operations. And so Facebook react and reacted by, uh, um, saying that it's going to apply a state-controlled label to certain news outlets. And that's really complicated. And in particular, they've decided that Al Jazeera is state-controlled. You know, these are things you can argue about. Um, but with, but, and Al Jazeera is very upset and threatened by this and concerned that it'll put their journalists in physical danger. Um, and Russia Today loves it because it's part of, part of the fun of being Russia Today is to create these problems for Facebook. And I think there's this idea that they're operating in a kind of static environment and able to make philosophical decisions when actually they're operating in a totally political environment dealing with antagonists who are, who are enjoying this and who are three steps ahead. And so I don't really have a solution, but it is a great story. <laughs> uh, just, and I, I will let Zoe reply, but you know, it, I understand that it's a reaction to the crisis, but the international community is famous for only reacting in the time of catastrophes or, or crisis. And could, I mean, could we blame them for doing what we all do? I mean, in the sense that don't you buy the argument that they, they are figuring it out and we all do because it's a new crisis, it's new online space that we're just not yet comfortable, mm -hmm. familiar with. Right, I think the question is, is what we want from private local businesses that they set up ideological frameworks and parallel governments under which they make decisions? Or do we want them to do what public opinion tells them to do? All right, Zoe, do you want to, do you have a burning reaction to this? I mean, not burning. I, I just will say um, that actually that that, that it, situation is exactly why we're setting up the oversight board. Um, because a lot of times, content decisions, um, people think that we make them based on all, there's all sorts of folk stories of how we make these decisions. We, we do it for the clicks and we're making all sorts of money off of terrible content, which is not true. Um, but they're in, in this vacuum of transparency around why we make the decisions that we do, there are these folk theories that pop up. And so I think one of the things that the oversight board will do is bring those discussions into the light provide a body of reason giving that people can track over time that makes a little bit more sense than, oh, you caved to pressure on this thing or you, you, you made a decision that was unpopular on this thing and people are having a hard time seeing um, what the rationale is as a, as a total package. And so, for example, the Alex Jones takedown decision, that would, that would potentially come before the board. 
Um, and so I think that's an important uh, uh, space that we're opening up for these conversations to be had out in the open. And that's, um, you know, I, I'm not naive enough to think that, that the board decisions will be totally removed from political considerations. Um, we are all political animals, I would say. But the advantage of it is that it will be removed from Facebook, right? There will be an independent trust that will fund the board, that will um, hold the employment relationship with its members. And so they have a little bit of insulation or padding to make their decisions um, based on their independent judgment. So that's exactly why I think we are setting up this board. Um, it remains to be seen whether it will fulfill that purpose. I really hope that it does. Um, but you will be the judge um, because the decisions will be public and our implementation of those decisions will be as well. Um, one of the questions that I have for, for our, our panelists that I think that is you know, f troubling me to some extent is um, we see many different efforts from the public, private sector, etc. Are they complementary? Are they supporting each other? Or actually are they happening in different bubbles and in siloed and eventually they, they will undermine? So yeah, Peggy, I think that you, you may have a overarching yeah, perspective no, on I that. I wanted to come back on this point because I think the, the discussion has really illustrated the introductory point I made about you know what are we expecting from companies and from government. And, and in answer to your question, I think the reality is they're not complementary and we're failing at all, I'd say, three levels. The government's failing, industry, so across the sector there's a failure and the individual companies are, are failing. Now, we've seen that Facebook, as we've heard, is making an effort to, to address that failure and I agree with Zoe that we have to give some space to see how that experiment develops. But it doesn't insulate the other two layers or the other companies from the fact that we just don't have um, in place the right types of mechanisms to address the fundamental questions that we've addressed. And government doesn't have to regulate speech. It can regulate the process, right? It can look at in pushing companies, for example, to do human rights impact assessments, to, to, that they ought to place greater responsibilities on them to do the sort of thing that Facebook is doing. So they don't have to get into the micromanagement, as, as Jacob has already told us, about you know, what exactly is being done. But they can enforce standards that could then be audited as to whether companies are doing things that will protect speech and protect people at the same time. And we also should be looking to the industry as a, as a whole. It doesn't make sense for Facebook to be doing this on its own, to be frank. Um, the same standards that we want applied in Facebook, we would want to be applied across other uh, companies and, and, and platforms as well. And why should there be one rule for hate speech on, on Twitter and one a different rule on uh, YouTube and a different rule on Facebook? So we need the companies to, to also look at models for self-regulation. And, and I know um, Access Now and uh, Article 19 and others and David Kay have really pressed for something called a social media council that could do that as well. Thanks. And, and on that point, I want to highlight that, um, so we talk a lot about, about Facebook Oversight Board because they're here on this panel, but we did try to engage other companies um, and unfortunately not very successful in doing so because they seem not to be ready um, to talk about it publicly and uh, not only Western companies, but I'm also uh, considering TikTok and others. In other panel, one mm -hmm. of the questions was like, are you afraid of TikTok? And I think it's, it's a fair question. Um, unfortunately, they're not on any panel, so it's it's difficult to actually dig dig uh, with them on, on this question. Um, is there any reaction for from different panelists? Otherwise, I'm I'm going to turn to um, our audience. Peter. Thanks. Um, I think two points. The uh, response to the crisis is is definitely true, and it's it's unfortunate. I mean, there are a lot of specifically women in civil society who've been drawing attention to the need for more transparency um, from the platforms on their uh, content moderation, content governance decisions for a long time. I just want to name Jillian York of OnlineCensorship.org, Rebecca McKinnon at Ranking Digital Rights, and uh, Then Mori at Equality Labs as as people who've um, you know, tried to warn, they've tried to sound the, the alarm uh, before Brexit, before the 2016 Trump election, um, and uh, I think for that reason, um, you know, we see that, that the civil society needs to be at the table 
um, in the design of these systems, uh, definitely at an industry-wide level. And that's why Access Now's conference, RightsCon, invites all stakeholders um, to the convening. Frankly, we could, we could use more governments in the room. And um, I think we shouldn't overlook, you know, my second point is that um, despite you know, the, the failure of a lot of the old forms of regulation, I think the courts are still um, best placed to, to be independent, impartial arbiters. Um, the judiciary and, and jurists need more instruction, need more education on how the internet works. Uh, they need more resources to handle the speed and scale. Um, but you know, you've seen areas like, uh, you know, for, all its, for all its warts, the, the intellectual property and copyright systems where resources have been put towards you know, swift resolution of, of claims involving the internet. And um, I, I don't think that sort of attention has been paid to this area. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, good, good call on RightsCon. We, we're working on it. Um, Jacob, you wanted to... Just yeah, I, I think we also could benefit from a bit of a historical perspective because uh, in, in some ways I don't think we're in a unique situation. I think it's a recurrent theme of history that every time the public sphere is democratized, either through new groups that were previously marginalized, didn't have a voice, or new technology uh, allows the public sphere to, to, to be widened, you will see that those who have a privileged access to shape public opinion uh, delve into a bit of a moral panic about you know what happens when you can manipulate the, the unwashed mob, uh, and it's not only the learned uh, intellectuals who can, who can shape public opinion. That, that, that really is a recurrent theme through, through, throughout history. And I also want to warn against, you know, if we set our sights on a, a, a global model where everyone says, kumbaya, we're in agreement, the, the limits on free speech are, we're in complete agreement, we're never, ever going to get there. You know, even, even you know, in homogenous democracies, that's, that you, you're going to have wild disagreements on the limits uh, of free speech. So it's a mirage. Only, I mean, the only reason, the only way we could get there would be to say, okay, we have to adopt the lowest level, the lowest uh, common denominator, where we say, across all cultures, what are your taboos? Uh, so, okay, we'll block, <laughs> you know, you can't, you, you can't violate that taboo, you can't violate that taboo. We're never gonna get there. You know, if we want to have a global governance where free speech plays an important part, we're gonna have to get accustomed to the fact that we're gonna see a lot of content that will, that will offend us, that we really don't like. Uh, we're never going to get rid of uh, disinformation. You know, that, that's a feature, not a bug of free expression. So we have to uh, make a decision on, do we think that the benefits of free speech outweigh the costs and the harms that are involved in free speech? My understanding of, of, of history so far is that the, the free speech does, you know, that it's, it's worth the price. Uh, it doesn't mean that it should be unlimited. But, but we're never going to get, you know, total uh, agreement. And that, I think, is extremely important to, to have that in the back of our minds, both of the institutions, but also of, of, of ordinary people, of media. And th the fact that you disagree about something does not mean that it should necessarily be banned or removed. That is actually a great segue to hear about the audience and see if they agree or disagree with what the panel say today. So we have quite a few questions. I'm going to take a few questions and then turn to the audience. Um, so... Uh, we have three questions on the front row. Can we start with the lady in the middle? Thank you very much. Uh, Harriet Moynihan from Chatham House. Uh, fascinating panel, really interesting insights. But it struck me that it's quite Western-centric so far, the discussion. Um, international human rights law is, of course, a universal framework. But countries around the world have very different approaches to issues such as freedom of expression. And I'm thinking in particular of countries like China. Um, so I guess my question is, where do uh, sort of non-Western platforms, particularly Chinese platforms, which are growing in influence, um, not just in China, but around the world, how do they fit into this, um, this discussion on new models? Hi, Jean-Paul Abel. I am the uh, <coughs> director of the uh, counter-tourism, uh, sorry, uh, the, I used to be the Assistant Secretary General in the UN for counter-tourism in the uh, Security Council, and uh, now I, I lead the, counter the uh, cyber security unit in the, in the military academy in France, but it is a research center, nothing else. So, when I was in the UN, uh, we had these discussions and this dialogue with the big companies. And just for me, you know, where I, put, where I put my radar 
at the certain point, I fully agree with what was said about there is no, there should be no limit, whatever. I mean, the, either you have the liberty or you have not the liberty. Still, even in the covenant, we have the Article 20, and the covenant on the civil and political rights, we have the Article 20, which make, which put a limit somewhere, which is hate in the, hatred speeches, etc., racial, and all of that. So we should still have somewhere, and we have the standard, we have this limit, but we should also think that somebody uh, should be responsible for this limit. Otherwise, I mean, we don't go anywhere. And where, what I want to say, while I agree on the principle, there are some, some cases in which you have conflict between the human rights themselves, because the right for life is there. And when you have people killing the others, especially for, uh, for terrorism, we should, and, and these hatred speeches are conveyed through internet, we should be able to look uh, into the matter and to discuss that. But with some parameters, if we don't put standards, then we go to illegal, uh, sorry, to, um, uh, to, demo to um, what do you call that, uh, illicit, Ill um, the, so the non-democratic world. Uh, yes, uh, that's what I want to say. So, how do you conceive that? Okay. That's that's really something which uh, hurts my my heart all the time. You using to be also a, a judge and, uh, and a lawyer. Uh, so that's what I want to say. At a certain okay. point, you have to exercise a certain power to put some limit. Great. Other que another question up here in the front. So, if you could give affiliation, short question. Matthew Wallen, I'll speak sure. briefly uh, from uh, American Security Project. I study public diplomacy. Um, on the topic of human rights, can we differentiate between the right to free speech versus the right to an audience um, and how that relates to social media and sort of tangentially um, how uh, a person's right to free speech might interfere with a person's right to live a peaceful life and not be harassed by others online? Perfect. I'll, I'll take maybe one last one. Gentlemen here in the back. Yeah, hello, Mohamed from Al Jazeera. Uh, I have like two questions mainly about, first of all, uh, like two weeks ago, we published our new guidebook about avoiding discrimination in hate speech in media. And actually our main challenge was defining hate speech. The UN uh, has failed until now to put uh, like a, def uh, a definition agreed on by the UN for hate speech. We have some suggestion from the European Council of Human Rights and all of these things, but we don't have any defining uh, uh, terminology for the, the, the hate speech. So that's why some media, social media platforms are using this vague terminology to uh, uh, take down a lot of contents on that platforms. Uh, especially recently, they're like uh, attacking Palestinian newspapers uh, uh, pages on Facebook just by uh, labeling them, label, labelizing them as anti-Semitic. We are just publishing news. So that's like the, the vague uh, use of, of, of this vague concept. And another part is uh, the uh, accountability over these platforms, as Peter mentioned about taking down a lot of evidences about human rights violations in Syria and other countries, just because they are violating the graphics uh, in that videos. So this need to be regulated actually. So my, my main question is, uh, does UN have a project to define uh, the hate speech and put it in a regulated uh, system. My other question about Facebook for Zoe, uh, you like talking about a new project, but actually we have experience with your previous project about fact checker, uh, Facebook fact checker. Uh, a Dutch newspaper website called NU has been uh, withdrawn from fact, fact checking project about from Facebook just because Facebook forbidding them from fact checking right wing uh, political uh, ad on Facebook. So Facebook like have these double standards when you're dealing with the content uh, on, its, uh, uh, on its platform, when you're dealing with like political ads from the right wings and, and, and Dutch. So that's my question, is that this new project will be like the same with the same double standard? Thank you. So we have question about um, non-Western culture, about who ultimately should uh, actually take those decision, um, about labeling definition and rights for speech and right to audience. So. Who wants to start? Is there any spit? Well, well, we'll go this way unless you don't want to address any question, but I think we probably all have things to say. So, Ben. I, mean, I guess I do think that the observation about, oh, sorry, that the observation about the difference between speech and distribution is 
part of how these companies will wind up answering this, uh, both in both in the ones that are based in Silicon Valley and the ones that are based in China. Um, that and you, in fact, it's the Chinese have done this for a long time. It's not necessarily that you won't aren't that no one has ever posted an image of Xi as Winnie the Pooh, but those things do not go viral. Um, and I think Reddit, actually, if you think about them, is in some ways the pioneer of this, that there are awful subreddits that are just very hard to find. If you know it's there, if you're looking for it, you can get to really kind of misogynistic communities and things like that, but, but they will never surface on the main page. I think Twitter, in particular, is pretty far down now at this point. But Twitter's <coughs> gotten a lot better over the last year, and I think that's in part because they're, it's not that you can't tweet, it's not that you can't send that tweet to somebody or somebody can't see it, but that tweet will be sort of muffled. And I think in some ways, I don't think it's that useful to say, are they media companies, are they not media companies, because who knows what that means. But it's a way for them to exercise a kind of editorial oversight at a top level without, 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 inter without censoring anyone exactly. And it, I do think that that's ultimately going to be where the compromise lies. Sorry, so I think a few questions were addressed to you specifically on definition of what. I think so. Um, so I'll take them one by one. Uh, to Harriet's question on, um, yes, this is a very Western set. Oh, I'm sorry. So t I'll take them one by one. So first to Harriet's question, uh, uh, I won't address how Western-centric this panel is because there's nothing we can do to fix that right now, but I duly noted. Um, I will say that one thing that we have internally talked about, and, I, and to be fully transparent and quite honest with you, I'm not sure if we fully landed on how we could or may not apply some version of a margin of appreciation principle to the board's decisions. Um, there is a tension between wanting to have a, one global set of policies that can be applied. People want us to apply our rules um, uh, fairly and evenly uh, across, across the platform. So there's that pressure and also the pressure to recognize that uh, the importance of local context, right? And the importance of local norms. And so that's where I think the international um, human rights community really has kind of led the way in figuring out how we apply norms, but with respect to um, various national differences. And I'd love to hear um, Peggy or, or you, Harriet, even uh, explain how we might be able to adapt some of those practices for the board. Um, uh, to Monsieur Laborde, uh, thank you very much uh, for mentioning Article 20 and also um, the conflict between the various, uh, the various fundamental human rights that are at play here. Um, I will also address um, this issue of how to define hate speech, and I'll turn to the UN, my colleagues at the UN. I um, left the UN, so I have a lot of uh, personal criticisms of that, uh, of, of that system. One <coughs> is for being quite slow. Um, but what I will say the advantage of the UN is that they have thought about ways to address process instead of um, uh, speech, types of speech directly. So I think the Rabat plan of action, for example, is really important here because it draws a line at incitement. Now, it's not perfectly applicable because those were standards set um, for a, a criminal standard, and we're really talking about what you can say on the internet, which might need to be a different standard, but I think that shows us a path forward. Um, and then finally, um, just to follow on on what Ben said about the right to speech doesn't mean the right of reach, one thing I will say is that when um, platforms have used demotions as a way to limit reach, uh, we do get pressure from civil society access now, um, rightfully so, and EFF and others to say that that's no different than taking something down. It's basically just doing it without transparency. Um, and so I do, while I do understand that principle uh, that, 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 that the right to speech doesn't mean you have the right to amplification, I do think we need to apply those tools very carefully and transparently. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, oh, on third party fact checking and political ads. Uh, political ads will um, will come into scope for the board over time, uh, uh, so they won't be immediately available when the board starts hearing cases at the beginning of next year, but political ads will be in scope. On third-party fact-checking, uh, we also are envisioning ways that those, those particular decisions can come before the board, so the specific decision for third-party fact-checking that um, could potentially come before the board is whether we were right to send a piece of content to a third party fact checker. 
um, in the first place because sometimes that decision itself is quite controversial uh, and so that's really what we want the board to focus on. We don't want the board to become um, a, a super third party fact checker where, where they are determining authenticity or um, truthfulness um, but they will be able to determine whether our processes were applied correctly in terms of sending content to third party fact checking. Right, she's obviously an expert I can tell the technical <laughs> level. Uh, Jacob, do you want to bring us more on the, on the policy yeah, debate um, front I, and I think the trade-offs? Uh, China is, is a, it's very important to, to take that up. I, I mean, obviously, when it comes to Facebook and Twitter, the, the discussion is a bit <laughs> irrelevant because they're, 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 they're not allowed. But I think it starts with, with pushback by, by, from democracies, which is not, which is not really <laughs> happening, and also uh, scrutiny ar around big tech companies about the, the potential role that they can play in, in, in sort of uh, maintaining the, 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 the Great Firewall and, and other types of, of technology that really has, has imposed a stifling social control and censorship in, uh, in China. I think that's where the discussion starts. And I, I'm quite disheartened by the lack of pushback uh, against uh, Ch China's role in this. Uh, when it comes to hate speech, I, I, I think David Kay has actually, uh, the, so the special rapporteur on, on freedom of expression, has done a lot to try and, uh, and, and clarify the, the, the limits wh where Article 20 applies. But I think it's also important to take in the drafting history of Article 20, because it was actually the Soviet Union and its allies that, 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 that proposed Article 20, and all democracies at the time were against it. So if you take Eleanor Roosevelt, she was very, very, very critical of it. And I think that... Uh, and you see that, you see hate speech laws being abused in a number of, of, of countries around the world. So I think uh, the approach uh, <clears throat> uh, where, say, hate, um, uh, hate speech laws uh, being applied is a last resort, is, is a sound model. And also I think we should be skeptical about the efficiency uh, of, 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 um, of, of, of these bans. It, it does not necessarily mean that, that, that people are not uh, racist or, or cannot um, get their, um, their, their views uh, out there. Um, then um, I, I think, you know, um, as much as I love Zoe, uh, I, th I, think we should, I think we should also be wary about creating a, a, a content um, uh, governance that is based on where Facebook and Twitter are now, because it is certainly not uh, certain that, that they will still have that position in five or 10 years. So there's very exciting work uh, being done about, you know, can we have more decentralized uh, uh, social media platforms? Um, uh, and, and, and that might happen uh, in the future. And, and, and then these uh, models uh, may not be as relevant. Uh, so, so the way that we're thinking about this uh, will we'll have to, uh, to develop, and I don't think we should just say, make sort of a, a Lex Facebook or Lex, uh, Lex Twitter. Right, maybe Peggy and Peter would talk about this vision and what's the alternative, and also if, if you want to address specific questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I wanted to start out uh, with with the point about the Western and, and other models because it's it's very crucial to me. It's like the debate we sometimes have about ethics and human rights in this space. Um, they're not in contradiction. We need to be able to work on both sides, and I think Jacob's points really show that. I do think that engaging and remember, it's not just. Western versus China. It's, it's the whole world that's at stake here, and there's a lot of ground in between. And that ground in between has to be strongly contested, and the way that that needs to happen is by the Western companies and governments putting forward a, a model that makes sense, it works for people, and for companies and governments, right? And what we have now is something that doesn't work for, for anybody very well. So, so we need to advance the, the Western model, but at the same time, we must in this international space be talking about how there is this, this common commitment under Article 19, under the international human rights framework that is agreed, not always applied as you pointed out, but needs to, to be the basis for conversation to try to push back on repression and on uh, limits on freedom of speech elsewhere. Um, on the definitional point, I'm, I'm glad you raised it. It is an important issue. I agree with Jacob that a lot of work has been done uh, and with Zoe for bringing up the Rabat uh, threshold test, which is a crucial step that we think is an important place. But ultimately comes back to the point I made earlier. Uh, this, and it goes to the question of the, the tension between rights. Ultimately, the way that we will resolve those questions 
is through having transparency at the forefront of all the decision-making processes and looking at the basic principles. And I hate to be a lawyer about it, but it's, it's actually doing the hard work of talking about is the response necessary and legal? Is it proportional? Does it serve a legitimate aim? And being able to justify why you've done what you're going to do. And that's what we don't have now, and that's what we desperately need. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter, la last word. <laughs> what does the community want? What can we do? Thank you. Um, I think that the community for, for some time has been um, asking for you know, a voice in content governance and content moderation decisions. Um, you know, these different models that we have, uh, you know, regulation with governments, governments meant to represent us, you know, the, the community of users. Um, we, we never really established that social license, that social contract with the social media companies. Um, you know, who have become kind of a putative public square. And so I think um, we're really critical of government um, initiatives on, on co what we call co-regulation, where they're pushing off what we think are essential government functions onto the private sector, um, as you know, even the EU has done with, with its code of conduct on hate speech. Um, but, you know, with Facebook's board, I think um, rather than outsourcing those decisions, they are, they are finally accepting that you know, they do impact a wider community than, than those you know, bound by, by those terms of service and use. And so uh, we, we are supportive of that um, uh, initiative as, as it seems to be going forward uh, in a responsive way. It's a way of achieving the diversity that's been lacking. So I think if you can go back to 2002, there was a fantastic statement um, uh, that came out of Durban around the need for you know more diversity in the staff of, of tech companies in the sector and that hasn't been achieved um, and I think you know until you get that diversity in a sector-wide basis and diversity of voices and, and firms um, from you know open source nonprofit social networks up to the, the proprietary folks um, you're gonna have to find new models to, to assert governance um, uh, and, and democratic governance. Um, and just uh, one point on the Chinese companies, I want to be clear, like, the standards are quite high and they're evenly applied across the world. We write to Chinese companies just like we write to every other company ranked by ranking digital rights. The Chinese companies have not responded, Tencent and Baidu, a couple years running. Um, th but the expectations are there and the invitations are there for them to participate in these dialogues. Thank you, Peter. I think we could have continued. Thank you very much. Very fascinating discussion. They're still here, so maybe your opportunity to take offline the question you may not have been able to ask. Please join me in thanking our great panel. Thank you for joining us today.